think my camera's on, right? Yep, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. So we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes as everyone trickles into the room. Dan, is my camera still on? I don't see. Uh, yes, Dan, okay. I, I can still see you. Okay, good. All right, well, why don't we why don't we start up and people can trickle in as we go. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Dan Driscoll. I'm the director for green transportation at the DCR. I'm here tonight with my colleagues, Dan Cushing, who is um, who is head of our community relations office, as well as Jeff Parenti, our deputy chief engineer. And we're here tonight to provide you with an update. And this was an informational meeting on the Watertown Riverfront um, Charles River Road phase two project. The image you see in front of you is a locust map showing you where we are, making sure you're all in the right meeting. And I want to uh, emphasize so everyone knows this meeting is being recorded so that others can access our website and and view this same update later on for those that were not able to make tonight's meeting. We'd like to welcome you on behalf of Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, EEA Secretary Theorides, and our current Acting Commissioner at the DCR, Stephanie Cooper. The mission statement of the DCR we like to review with all groups that we present to is to protect, promote, and enhance our commonwealth of natural, cultural, and recreational resources for the well being of all. The project team on this project was the DCR. We are the leader on the project and the project proponent. Hatch Design was the consultant who did the roadway design, all of the landscape architecture and pathway and river improvements, as well as the permitting. And Haven Construction is the contractor that many of you have probably seen out there over the past six weeks. They're responsible for all of the construction on site. Uh, many of you are familiar with phase one of this project, which included the Braille Trail, a lot of restorations of pathways, some great landscaping enhancements. This is phase two of that project of the Watertown Riverfront Charles River Road project. The goals of this project include providing ADA compliant sidewalks on both sides of the Charles River. This is particularly important on the residential side where there's a lot of gaps in connectivity between crossroads to make it safer for all users to both travel along the road, but also to be able to cross it. We're going to strengthen connections between the neighborhood and the park with new crosswalks. And this is really a, a, a regional benefit. So if you're coming from even Lexington or Belmont or communities to the north and find yourself coming down these side streets trying to get to the Charles River, there will now be ample safe ways to connect to this important reservation. We're going to do a lot of stabilization of the riverbank erosion and uh, provide enhanced access to the river itself. We're restoring a greenway path adjacent to the river and Perkins Hill. Provide updated um, ADA compliant access to the playground that's on site. Currently, the steep hill that goes down to that playground is actually not compliant for ADA. And that's going to help people a lot with baby carriages, as well as obviously anybody with a disability and the elderly. And again, we're looking for regional destinations for all citizens to create this as a really special place that people will come and visit from other communities as well. Uh, this design process, while while we haven't seen some of you in a while, um, initially it did have a quite a robust um, public process. It was community driven. We had a stewardship group that we met with regularly and we did community site visits. You see some of the photos down below that represent some of the good um, meetings and all the valuable input we got from many of you. Um, the design was, um, you know, we went through both concepts, schematic designs, design developments, and ultimately all the way to bid documents and, 
and construction documents and which we're now in the construction and we 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 covered all of our permitting which was somewhat extensive you can see the list to the right i'm not going to go through all that but all permits are in hand obviously or we would not be under construction these are the project limits for phase two so it's not quite the entirety of, of everything along Charles River Road, although it does go pretty much from the square to the Yacht Club, but everything inside those dash yellow lines will have work going on as part of this project. So what's featured in phase two? Um, I mentioned this a little bit in the goals, but I wanna be really clear so everyone knows what we're doing out here. Uh, the playground ADA access, that's gonna be corrected. That's really important. Narrowing of the roadway shoulder. This is up by the Yacht Club all the way back um, heading west down Charles River Road uh, so that we can provide a continuous uh, ADA. When I say ADA, for those that don't know it, that's the American Disabilities Act. We're going to provide full ADA access on a new sidewalk by narrowing the road in that section. We're doing a major pathway restoration behind the Perkins Hill. Many of you have probably been back there and seen that sort of popular, but somewhat um, broken up and, and disrepaired uh, um, paved path. That's all going to get restored as part of this. We're creating some additional river access points where people will be able to come out and actually connect to the river and enjoy it whether it's for fishing or just sitting and enjoying all the beautiful views along here. And we're going to fix 20 problem areas along the river where over the years there's been extensive erosion from the boat traffic and and just natural erosion that occurs on a river's edge with people coming down to it and the and the and the um, wave impacts from um, again from the boats. We're doing a lot of enhanced planting. A lot of our planting is it's all going to be native planting palette, and we're going to put in five new crosswalks and all new sidewalks and ramps connecting those crosswalks along the residential side of the road. This is not a great map, but I wanted to show this just because it, it, it's the best image we have to show the location of our five new crosswalks. This is Irving Street, where the two pink lines are. That's existing, as many of you know, that's a signalized crossing. That's the primary crossing to connect all of the um, all of the, the, the people at the Perkins School that had vis visual disabilities, and that's all designed to be able to cross that population of people safely as well as everybody else. These five new crosswalks that we're going to put in are not signalized, but they, they will be well marked with ramps. Um, this, this first one you see here is at Riverside Street. That's up here. The second one is at Wheeler Lane. The third one all the way down here to the east is Paul Street. And then we have one at Bay Street. And I'm sorry, it's uh, Pequasset Street is the third one. And then we have one at Bay Street and one at Paul Street. As I said, we're doing a lot of stabilization of the riverbank. So here's some examples where in some cases it might just be stone steps. Uh, we're going to put in one more overlook deck. This is going to be down behind the Perkins Hill in that section of parkland that over the years have become a little bit beat up and degraded. We're going to be doing all new benches in that park, new pathways, and we're going to have not quite this size, but there'll be a nice overlook that's going to be put in on that section of the river. We're also doing a lot of vegetated slope stabilization as well as part of this project. Here's the path I mentioned, um, the, the upper left photo in this corner, that's the sort of beaten up path behind the Perkins Hill. You can see a lot of the erosion that's happened near, in that area. This is the path coming down off Charles River Road that leads into that area. This will all get torn up and restored as part of this project. It's a, and I, I just wanna add, this is a complicated piece of work given its sort of isolation and the inability to get any kind of heavy equipment in there. A lot of this is gonna be handwork and literally done with wheelbarrows and, and small Kubotas bringing materials in and out. All the pathway work we're doing on this section, not including the sidewalks, the sidewalks will be either concrete or asphalt, but the pathways within the park themselves, we're gonna be using environmentally friendly materials 
it's either going to be done in organic lock. This is a stabilized stone dust. Or in the case of behind the Perkins Hill, one section of that is going to be this flexible porous surfacing. That's going to hold up a lot better to the roots so that it won't get torn back up and cracked the way it is now. Uh, it also is porous, which it gives a little hydrologic and hydraulic benefit as well to the path. Um, the park I mentioned where the overlook will be just beyond Perkins Hill toward the Yacht Club, that pathway will all be done in this organic lock surfacing. This is the same stuff that we used all behind the uh, Braille Trail and the loop around the Braille Trail. So many of you have already been enjoying this particular material, and it's quite popular amongst the public and users. Again, we have a lot of riverbank stabilization spots. We have 20 of them. This is an example of um, what we'll be doing here. That's underway right now. You can see activity over there going on along the river. These are called core logs, and we put in these core logs and then we actually are going to be putting in live stakes. The live staking will happen this winter. You want to put in your live stakes when they're dormant for the highest level of success of the live staking. And, and then um, when fully realized, you'll start to see this going on along the river instead of these sort of eroded, chunked out banks that we've all been looking at, you know, again, for a couple of decades. So this is exciting work uh, ecologically to get this done. I'm showing another example of that because this is the Perkins Hill. Uh, Perkins Hill is, is particular. This is looking uphill right here on the right photo, existing condition. We'll be putting in extensive core logs going all the way up the Perkins Hill, re-landscaping it, planting it, doing a diverse native plant community. And this is going to be good for wildlife, ecology, and the river because all the sediment that pours off this hill into the river will no longer do that. And it'll protect the porous path that we'll be building on the bottom of the hill. This is the corner I talked about. Um, this is currently of the entire 16 mile Charles River Basin Loop, which goes from the dam at Watertown Square, Watertown Dam, all the way to the Museum of Science. Amongst that 16 mile loop, this is literally the only section that does not have an ADA compliant route for somebody in a wheelchair or even you know baby carriages with a mother or father all these things children elderly that's what's there now this is going to get bumped out the curb will come out to this about this white line and there will be a new sidewalk connecting all the way down to the new sidewalk by the watertown yacht club and that new sidewalk will connect around this corner to the existing sidewalk so that if you want to walk or, or, or wheel your child or wheel yourself in a wheelchair, you will be able to do that safely all the way between the square and North Beacon Street. So I was going to go over the construction schedule with you all so you'll know what to anticipate and what you can expect to be seeing. This is a typical construction schedule that the, that the uh, contractor, um, Haven Construction, will be doing. They will not be out there any earlier than seven in the morning. They typically are working seven to three. Some days they may go a little later. Um, they are authorized to work on Saturdays if necessary. I don't think you'll see them out there a lot on Saturdays, but it could occur. Um, so the first thing we did was completed in November of 2021. We installed erosion control and our staging area. The area you see in the middle of the park surrounded by fencing is what we call our staging area. That's where we're, we are properly storing any construction equipment and as well as materials that need to be stockpiled for the construction itself. And um, all of that will get restored at the conclusion of the project. Our trailer is was coming out this week. Um, there'll be a field trailer. We have an on-site DCR field engineer who will be there full time, um, who will be you know observing and managing all of the activities that take place on that project. And we urge you, if you have any questions or concerns on the construction, that's the person to talk with. Um, it's always it's never really a great idea to sort of just go up and start talking to contractors. 
Um, they're doing other things, they're busy, and they're not necessarily the right people to communicate with on your issues. So we appreciate that. We, as I said, that we're restoring 20 erosion control problem areas. That is underway. You can see the work going on along the river. They've been working really hard on that. We'll be putting the live stakes into those erosion restoration areas between January and March of this winter, 2022. Tree removal and pruning um, actually started this week. I was out there with the team. Almost all of the tree removal that's going on is being done because they were hazard trees. We looked at them very closely with an arborist. We actually um, walked the site with the conservation agent from Watertown, as well as the arborist from Watertown. So we're really trying to be inclusive on this with the town as much as possible. Um, we did have to remove one tree down by the monument that was healthy. It was a, a healthy Zelkova that had to be removed because we're putting in a crosswalk there and to get the proper landing um, the good news is by removing it, it does open up better views of the Salton Stall Monument, and it's going to be a really excellent spot to have a crossing so people coming along the river that see that monument are going to have a safe way to go over and enjoy that site. Um, we may begin demolition and removal of the path uh, behind the Perkins Hill this winter. That's going to be weather permitting. If, if we get a bad winter and there's a lot of snow, they will not do that. But if it stays uh, reasonable, even in the cold, they'll do it. It's just a question of how much snowfall and whether or not it melts and they get windows of time to go out there and start doing the demolition. The majority of work on the project is going to happen this spring and into, into the fall of 2022. The activities that will happen this spring starting in mid late March will include narrowing Charles River Road. Uh, we'll have to saw cut the road. There will be a, um, probably a detour and a police detail set up when that happens. And we'll be installing the new sidewalk that I mentioned from Watertown Yacht Club all the way to the west to connect to the existing sidewalk. New sidewalks and ramps on the residential side of Charles River Road will all be going in as well in the spring and summer. And that's going to be really excellent. There's going to Anywhere now where there's not a connecting sidewalk, with the exception of in front of Perkins, because you cannot, you just cannot fit a sidewalk in there. But near all the residential properties, anyone will be able to walk out of their home or down the side streets and the neighborhoods and get to a sidewalk, which will get you to a safe place to cross to the Charles River Reservation. The ADA access to the playground will happen as well this spring and summer. Um, the, the five new cross walks that I mentioned with all the proper ramps and compliant ramps uh, again will happen. And the new porous pavement um, and the pathway between Charles River and Perkins Hill that will occur probably in the summer, possibly early fall. And we'll also be restoring as you many of you may know, there's an area near the Perkins Hill where there's a steep asphalt path that currently comes down toward the river. We're actually going to be restoring that asphalt path as well as part of this project. And then we'll be doing extensive um, planting of native landscaping, meadow mixes and grass mixes throughout the site. And uh, we'll be finishing the riverbank access areas with the steps, the stone and the one overlook deck that I that I mentioned. Our projected um, completion date for the project is fall of 2022. And with that, we wanted to open it up to you, all of you. Dan will um, help navigate your questions and comments, and uh, Jeff and I will be happy to take those. Thanks, Dan. So um, I just want to reintroduce myself. So my name is Dan Cushing. I'm the DCR Director of Public Engagement, and how we're going to go through the questions and comments tonight are two ways. We're going to have raised hand function. So I see some of you have already uh, done that, and then we also will answer your questions in the chat. Um, I will read the chat. So um, I'll start with uh, Senator Brownsberger and I'll also just quickly acknowledge that we have um, 
uh, Representative Owens, uh, Councillors uh, Gannon and Bays on the call as well. So thank you everyone for showing up and um, we can start uh, the questions and comments now. So I'm going to give you permissions to unmute yourself, Senator, and now you can uh, uh, should be able to unmute yourself using the Teams button. Thank you. I just wanted to say how great it was to see both uh, Dan and Jeff here today. Uh, two of my heroes in public service. Uh, you know, I know Dan's been with this project for uh, probably 15 years in stages, and um, it's that kind of follow through over the long term. Uh, you know, bird dogging it through the uh, bureaucracy and, uh, you know, solving the design problems and um, that that ultimately gets us to the to the place where, uh, where we can sort of support a project to, to get it done. And and Jeff's Jeff's one of the best engineers out there from a traffic standpoint. And so I know that the that the design features of this from a road standpoint are going to be uh, safe and uh, pedestrian and bicycle thoughtful. Um, and uh, so I, I feel great about the uh, the leadership of this project, and I just wanted to really say that and um, just express my appreciation also to the past commissioner DCR for um, you know hearing our pleas to uh, move this forward and and putting together the funding, um, including you know from a lot of sources. Um, and um, so I'm I'm grateful for all of that. And I also also want to thank you know there's some really great people on this call who have been with this project for a long long time from the citizen standpoint and have had a huge, a very hands-on input into to many of the thoughts on this. I'm sure we'll hear uh, more from some of them tonight, but um, I, I just want to express my great appreciation for everybody on this call and the place that we've gotten to with this project. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this roll out over the next, uh, of, over the coming months. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, Senator. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to the next hand raised here. So, uh, uh, Marcia, uh, I'll give you permissions to unmute yourself. So you should be able to do so now. And then, um, yeah, if you'd like to provide question or comment. Yes, um, not to get into too much hagiography hey here, but I just do want to uh, thank you all for um, for this nice plan. I, I, I really think it's... Um, it just looks really great. I, and thank you for sending me the plans. I've shared them with other people in the neighborhood and I think we're pretty enthusiastic about, about it. Um, and I just also wanted to thank um, Senator Brownsberger's office for being with us, you know, hanging in there with us for so long and, and uh, Steve Owens as well as, you know, coming a little, little late, but he, I know he cares about it too. So um, with that, I just want to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, the metal barrier that goes along the road. Is that going to stay or is that going to go? That will go. That's you, I, I believe you're referring to the guardrail. The guardrail, yes. Yeah, yeah. The metal guardrail. Yeah, Je Jeff and I sort of have a a standard that we we do not like to use highway guardrail on our parkways unless there's a really good reason for it. So that guardrail will go. Um, there will be a section of guardrail put back in that is more appropriate. It will be a, a parkway guardrail, which is um, steel backed wood, and um, it will not be as extensive as that guardrail that's there now. That was a little bit over designed, and we have we have gone over the the safety parameters and have discussed and have ascertained that we think we can reduce the length of the guardrail, but we will be putting some back, and it will be uh, from the from the perspective of the residential side, you'll see a nice wood guardrail, which will be a big improvement. Okay, great. And then um, I have a couple of other questions. One is that there's that tree on the Perkins Hill that is at the top that where you see all the roots. Um, I, I have this this I, I have this sort of sentimentality with certain trees in the area that I pass by every day. And that tree is just stayed alive for so many years as it just erodes underneath of it. I wonder what you're going to do with that tree. Um, just how you're going to treat that tree? Will it have to go, or how how will how will that be treated? It's it's not going to go. Is this the tree that someone sort of built a fort in? It's it's got a funny. Um, it's, right? it's, it's, it's the one in your picture that you when you look up the hill, it's just all roots. You just see this whole. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it will not go. When we put our core logs in and we do our, our restoration of that bank, the hope is that as we build up the core logs, you'll be able to backfill in some stabilization soil, which will cover some of that root base and give that tree a little more stability and uh, and probability of survival. So our our plan is to do everything we can to save that tree. Oh, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and then I have another question. Um, a couple of us on the, the other side of Perkins, on the uh, east side of Perkins, um, we, uh, we use our boat. We ha all have, you know, boats and kayaks and we try to launch over there. And, um, I know I, I put a little, little couple of rocks on down my end that I call Bay street landing that you can hardly see, but it's, um, it's not that easy to get in and out there. Um, and then there's another open area down, um, a, a little bit past, uh, Palmer street. And I just wondered if there's any possibility of putting like a kayak launch in there, you know, the kind that you can kind of pull yourself up and get out um, of a kayak or or a small boat. Is is there any? Do you ever do that in any of your areas? Um, we, we we've done them. We the, the, I think the closest you know the closest one that's really designed kayaks are tricky because you need a low head on the dock so you can kind of slide off the dock into your kayak. Yeah. as you know, and um, they're a different kind of structure. There's one at Ward Ave in Waltham, which is a prominent access point to the Lakes District. Um, we could look We could look into that. We are going to do an improvement. Um, as you walk through the Braille Trail, there's a flared opening into the river where I've seen people putting canoes in. And right now it's kind of eroded and the stone is gone. We're gonna build that up and actually put the porous pavement there so it will be an it, it will transition smoothly into the river. It'll work really well for um, for canoes. Kayaks are a little trickier. We could circle back and maybe in a later phase and talk about that. It's not something we'd be able to add to this phase, but but it, it certainly would be nice to be able to get them in there. I know we do have the Watertown Landing down near the square, but that's a little bit high for getting in a kayak. Yeah, that's a little too high. I, I I'm thinking more down our end. Um, because it's so nice to just be able to carry things across the street. And, yeah, and toward, toward the Yacht Club. I mean, another thought, and I don't want to corner the Yacht Club, but for years people have been trying to look at some, some public mitigation where the Watertown Yacht Club might be able to help out a little more and do something that, uh, you know, is, is of, of public benefit. And they certainly have a lot of extensive dock systems at that Yacht Club. And may, maybe there's a possibility of talking to them about allowing some sort of community access uh, to the river uh, with utilization of one of those structures, because um, there's certainly plenty there to do it. Yeah, we. I think that would have to come from a state um, thing, because we have talked to them about that. I actually went down myself and asked them if I could, you know, launch from their places, and they told me I had to buy a $3,500, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, membership. So yeah. they're not real open to it. So I think I think that would have to come from um, the state saying that you absolutely have to provide some kind of public public amenity. Um, yeah. And I think they should because I, I'm not really for private use of uh, public land myself. So right. we I appreciate those comments. We, we will right now the DCR, it's been ongoing. We are actually reviewing all of the boathouse leases along the river. Um, they're complicated. There's a lot of them up and down the river, but one of the things we're looking at closely is what kinds of public benefits are reasonable and, and not cumbersome on the operations of the Yacht Club. So when we get to that one, this is something that we'll uh, make sure is at least talked about. Okay, okay. that's good to hear. And the other, the only one last question, um, can we get a copy of this presentation? Just um, the, the short, the PowerPoint or whatever it is that you have, is there a way to? Get a copy yeah, of that. Want to talk to take that? Yeah. So both the uh, presentation and the recording will be available after uh, the meeting. So um, and uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll link the uh, the location where we'll have that uploaded as well. Um, so you'll you'll get it after the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciated. You're welcome. Yep. And uh, thanks for your your questions and comments tonight. So um, we'll move over to the next hand raise now. So uh, Andy. Um, I'm going to give you permissions to unmute your mic now, so you should be able to do it. 
All right, thank you. Um, and thanks, Dan. Um, I think we're all looking forward to uh, the results from this project. Um, it'll be uh, Andy, you cut out. I'm not sure. I couldn't hear you, Andy. Um, is this any better? Yes. Yep. OK, all right. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to the results. Um, you know, it's a nice polish on one of Watertown's um, best assets, and I particularly like the uh, continuous sidewalk through the corridor. But I, I do have a question: where that sidewalk is introduced, what happens to the de dedicated bike lane that's there? Um, after we introduce the sidewalk, the, the there's enough room on the cross section of the road. Jeff, Jeff is, you know, as Senator Brownsberger pointed out, people really don't should not appreciate. Uh, Jeff's perspective on on transportation in the region and his commitment to complete streets. We can tolerate um, a 10 and a half foot uh, or lower up to 10 foot travel lanes. And in doing that, we will restripe that section of the road and there will still be bike lanes in both directions. You will on the river side, you will lose a little bit of the buffer. Uh, there's a stripe buffer right now, so it'll become more of a traditional bike lane with a fog line, and we will have to sacrifice a little bit of the buffer that's currently striped. But we're going to have bike lanes in both directions. That will not be lost. All right, so for the cost of a little buffering, we gain safe pedestrian access. Correct. Excellent. All right, um, the other question I have is a colleague pointed this out, that uh, the lighting along the, the corridor, um, he pointed out that in the, in the Beechwood section, there's kind of a gap in the lighting. And I guess the question would be, could that be addressed? Jeff, you want to take that? I have to admit, I'm not familiar with uh, all of the light fixtures on Charles River Road, but um, if it's not in the scope of this project, we can do it separately. We have our electrical engineering section is equipped to do that. Um, so whether we have fixtures that are not operating or poles that need to be added. Uh, my assumption is that um, we have fixtures that are out, not that we have poles missing. Either way, uh, well, we will uh, make sure that that gets. So, so I actually rode through there uh, at noon and it does look like they just, it you know, it, it looks like there should be a pole there, but there isn't. It, it's like, it's like a gap. So okay. uh, it'd be great if, if, if that could be looked into that, that you know, I. I you know, yeah. any way that we can improve safety would be would be great. So I appreciate that. Take a look um, at it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Andy. Um, so we'll move to the next hand raise now. So Sarah, Sarah, I'll give you permissions to unmute your mic. So you should be able to do that now. Um, so Sarah, you have the ability to do that now on your end, or at least you should be able to. Um, it's uh, the the microphone button towards the top of the meeting. Yep. There, did that work? Yep. Sorry, <laughs> my computer no was stuck for a minute. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, thank you for recognizing me. Um, so to completely repeat what Marsha just said, um, huge thanks to everybody involved in this project. I think I've been hearing about um, this phase of the Charles River, um, you know, re renovation projects for um, a really long time, 10, 15 years, something like that. But it's incredible that the same people have been involved in this. And so uh, Dan Driscoll, thank you so much, and Jeffrey Parenti, and um, Senator Brownsberger and your whole office, you've been incredibly supportive and really, really helpful. You've been out for site visits. We've walked the whole length of the river together with you and your staff. Um, and our local reps, all, everybody within Watertown government has been um, really supportive about this as well. So it's. It's just, it's been a huge project and um, Marsha circulated the plans that she got from DCR and a bunch of us have perused the documents really carefully. And it's just incredible what is included in here. There's so much good stuff. So this is, it's just a really, really incredibly exciting phase to be seeing all these crosswalks, all these riverfront improvements. Um, it's, it's just tremendous. So I'm really looking forward to it. I do have questions, of course. Um, so um, we've talked about, um, there's, the the riverfront path that starts right at the Watertown Yacht Club and runs uh, on our end, so Bay Street, Paul Street, Palmer, um, 
and then this path goes down into the really skinny section down below Perkins, um, and then it merges into the wider path. There are small, old, feeble signs pointing the wrong directions that say no bicycles. Um, and a lot of us have walked along there, and at times, you know, two people can barely pass. And when there's a family of five bicycles coming at you, it gets kind of crazy. So I just, I wanted to, I don't know if that's the scope of this project is signage and, you know, where bikes go, where bikes don't go. But I know it's something that we've discussed before. Um, and it looks like the paths are still going to be kind of skinny on this portion. They're much wider, obviously, down in the Braille Trail section. Um, so I don't know if that's part of the scope of this project, but it's it's definitely still a concern. You know, bikes come plowing through there and, and it's really, really narrow. Yeah, so we, we will be taking out those old signs that are, I think they still say MDC on them. Um, <laughs> yep. so, so the old signs will come out. Um, the pathway, the tight section of the pathway with the with the porous pavement area will only be four feet. So you're right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't meet any standards for sharing pedestrians and bikes together there. Um, we don't intend to actually ban bicycles from going down there. Um, that's really hard to enforce. I do think if there's problems, we could, you know, Jeff and I could consider that. But I think with the new sidewalk and the bike lanes, um, you know, they're just much better biking facilities available than going down that path. People that want to experience going along the river there, it is kind of fun. We, we are going to restore the paved path that goes down the slope. I think bikes will use that. That's going to be eight to 10 feet wide and mm -hmm. transition to the stabilizer path all the way to the Braille Trail. And when you come off the, um, the tight section of path, where there's now those sort of broken benches in that little park. That little park is just such a sweet little spot that's been forgotten about. We're gonna restore those benches and put in new benches. We're gonna have an overlook there. And the path there is gonna go to eight feet wide. So we're gonna take up that old paved path there and restore it with a stone dust path, similar to what's down by the Braille Trail. So overall, there should be a lot more room for everyone to share. And um, if we have to put up signs that bikes must yield to pedestrians or something like that, we can do that through our DCR sign shop um, after the fact. That's not a problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I, so we, we're all very aware of the hill um, directly behind Perkins where Marsha was talking about the tree with the exposed roots, and it's just such an eroded hill. Um, and I think the plan that's designed just looks incredible to sort of bolster up that hill. Um, what I've observed, a lot of us have seen, is that that hill's very appealing to occasional people who want to sort of try their mountain climbing and their mountain bike biking. Um, and a bunch of us have, you know, moved logs back and forth. So now it's, you know, it's kind of washed out and it's partly dirt. And I think it looks like it's going to be much more sort of structurally involved. But um, it's it's just so tempting. And I know that, I mean, I've, I've seen bunches of people coming along on their mountain bikes and like they just can't resist. They want to go flying down it. So do, do, do you think the new design is going to be um, mountain bike proof? I, I do. Um, it, it, the way these core logs work is they it's almost like a set of steps. So you yep. have a core log and then it gets planted, then another core log, and they sort of gradually go up the slope. I mean, there may be mountain bikers in New England that could get up that. I don't know any of them, um, and I'm a pretty avid mountain biker. It, 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 I do not think it's going to be something that people are going to try to uh, do that on. There is a trail off the little park area that is a dirt trail that kind of goes up to the top of that hill. Mm -hmm. they, they may continue to use that little trail, um, yeah. but if I, as far as the backside of the hill, in all the restoration work we're going to do, um, I, I would be really surprised if somebody could do that. Yeah, okay, good. Because um, I think they've just contributed to the erosion, but right now it's just, you know, open dirt, so it's sort of sure. much more yeah. in inviting, it's much more of it accessible. Um, so during construction, um, are the paths going to be semi-accessible um, or on and off accessible or partially closed? Um, there will be a through route for the entirety of the project. When they're actually doing the path behind the Perkins Hill, that will be closed for um, probably a couple of months at some point because there's just no way there's going to be guys <laughs> going. It's so narrow and yeah. they'll be going in and out of there with literally uh, wheelbarrows filled with the porous paved material 
and it just would not be safe for them to have to navigate the public coming through there. So there'll be some temporary closures, but th th there'll always be a way to travel along Charles River Road for motorists and pedestrians and bikes. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Um, and one last question I definitely saw on the plans, there's a lot of plantings, a lot of shrubs, a lot of low plantings. Are there trees being added along this whole project? There are some trees. Um, there, there's not as many because a lot of the erosion control areas, uh, smaller plant material makes more sense. But yes, we do have a number of trees. I don't have the number offhand, but um, we are we are planting certainly more trees than we removed. Um, we'll be putting in uh, native trees along here. Yes. Okay. Um, again, I think that's all of my questions for now. And um, thank you all so much. And I'm just Really looking forward to seeing this project roll out. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your great comments. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. So uh, at this point, I'm going to go over to the chat and just capture the comments that are being posted there on the recording. Um, so let me just do that really quickly. Um, so Jim and Kate said that this is great. Thank you all for the hard work and investment in this area. Uh, thanks, Jim and Kate. Um, they also said that um, they would also like uh, that feature in reference to the, I believe it was in reference to the kayaking launching zone. That was when that comment was posted. Um, and then uh, uh, Marcia said that uh, there used to be a light pole between Beechwood and Bacosset, but a speeding car took it out last year. And then also she said bikes are a big problem for us walking along that path signs to alert bicyclists to yield to pedestrians would be really helpful so i wanted to read those those are all the comments okay um so we can over go over to david now so david i'm going to give you permissions to unmute your mic so you should be able to do that now I'm um, not sure if you see that, David. OK, um, well, while David tr uh, tries to figure that out, I'll, I'll we'll move over to the representative. So Representative Owens is on the call, also has his hand raised. So I will give you permissions to unmute your mic now as well. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, the nice thing about going towards the end is that everybody's already said the great things that uh, that I was going to say. So you got I, I, my thunder is completely stolen. Uh, first of all, thanks to Dan and and, and Jeff. This is uh, this is great and a long time coming. And I want to echo everybody's uh, appreciation for Senator Brownsberger. I know that um, a year ago it looked like this might not happen, and I I met with the senator, and all of a sudden. Things started moving again, so uh, so thanks certainly uh, to Senator Brownsberger. Um, I think that uh, we all owe him a, a, and his office a great deal of, of gratitude for this. I really just wanted to echo the the uh, the comments about the um, the bicycle signage. It's something that I've been hearing from a lot of uh, constituents, um, particularly around the Braille Trail area. The, the worry is that it might be some you know folks with uh, with low vision uh, and causing. Um, uh, and interacting with the with the bicycles in that way might create a dangerous situation. So that was just something that had been flagged for me by a number of a number of folks and wanted to echo uh, the comments from the chat and from from Sarah. But um, apart from that, I'm uh, really, really excited to see this uh, project move along and um, uh, uh, really uh, thankful for the great work that you guys are doing. Yeah, th thanks, Representative. Um, we we appreciate that, and I think um, you know as as we get closer to completing construction next summer, maybe J Jeff and I will take a closer look at the overall circulation um, of of what what's really going to happen when we we fix all these things and um, and think about what is the right places for bikes to be and not be, and what kind of signage we can do to try to encourage that kind of behavior. And it's a great point that if you have vis visually disabled people on those stone dust paths, you certainly don't want fast cyclists going through there. Um, people seem to have been really courteous for the last couple of years, understanding that it's a braille trail. I, I haven't heard of conflicts, but we wanna make sure that um, we guide people in the right places uh, along the entire facility. So thank you for the comment. Uh, thanks, Rep. And um, 
I'll move over to the next hand raise. So, David, I don't know if um, there are issues on, on your end with the uh, with the unmuting. Uh, maybe I can try to help troubleshoot that, but um, uh, let us know in the chat one way or the other. But we'll move over um, to, to Councillor Gannon. So I will give you permissions to unmute your mic. So you should be able to do so now. Um, so you should have permissions to unmute your mic now. I'm not sure. Um, uh, OK, uh, in light of this, I guess we'll move over to Susan. So Susan, oh, OK, I think I'm on. You got it now. Yep. OK, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and and thank you. Uh, 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 well, first of all, thank you to TCR staff and to Will Brownsberger and Steve Owens for your great efforts on on this um, Central Park for Watertown. It's it's an amazing resource for Watertown to have the amenities of the Charles and and uh, all. Um, it's uh, in the great traditions of Fred O'Gall Homestead. And uh, Dan Driscoll, you carry on his legacy with uh, all your work and. Um, continuing the path up to Waltham and uh, back 30 years ago when I was a town attorney in Watertown, I, I helped you out uh, with engaging residents who were using the um, path between uh, Watertown Square and Bridge Street as their own backyards, driveways and gardens. So it's a it's quite a development. And and with regard to this project, it looks looks amazing and I'm looking forward to seeing the fruits of that labor. But um, do have a, a few questions as well. And first, I'd like to follow up on the comments made about the the uh, Watertown Yacht Club. Now, I grew up in Watertown and I've been using the bike paths and, and uh, the paths for since I was a little kid. And back in the day, before the Charles River Yacht Club put up this humongous fence around its property, the continuation of the path used to go into what is now fenced off within the Charles River Yacht Club, um, such that you could ride a bike or walk all the way up to the driveway um, that leads into the uh, Watertown Yacht Club. So I see that as somehow the Charles River Yacht Club took away what had previously been a public benefit and uh, during any lease renewals, um, I uh, I would recommend re revis revisiting that issue because it was a nicer part of the of the path as well. And I'd like to see if that can be reopened um, beyond this huge fence that they unfortunately put in. Um, also, um, I presume that the 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 pathway right along the Charles River is going to be a continuation of the sand path that presently leads from Watertown Square to the Perkins Hill path right now, where the broken asphalt resides now. Yeah, I mean, you may have missed early in the presentation. I showed two materials um, and, and thanks for those comments and all your help years ago up in the river. It was really helpful. Um, yeah, the the. We're going to use two materials. One is the stabilizer, which is the sort of sandy looking stone dust that you see all around the Braille Trail and, and that area. That will be used wherever we can we can do it. The really tight section that goes over the tree roots and is, is complicated, we're going to use a porous pavement material that will be a little darker. We're going to use, I think, a brown color. So we'll try to look a little natural, but it does have rubber in it. And we want to use this material because it allows us to kind of go over some of the of the tree roots there and fill in and not have to cut as many trees. And it also is porous, so water can go through it. And it's got a sort of a rubbery feel that uh, is soft to walk on, but it's going to hold up a lot better. The stabilizer in that area, the stone dust, it's 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 just too steep and, and it would erode and it it's, would not hold up there. So we think we picked the two best materials we could that will be environmentally friendly and uh, compatible for for all users. Right, because I was I was received an injury in that very area where I was running, and what appeared to be a pile of leaves was actually a large hole. So uh, I got a hip injury that uh, took some time to heal. Uh, so appreciate that. Um, yeah. And also. Um, 
across the street from Perkins Hill, the on DCR property on the Perkins side, tons of uh, fallen trees and tree branches. Will that be cleaned up or it'll be? That, that's not going to be cleaned up as part of this. We 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 need to, you know, Perkins has been trying to do some maintenance along here for us. They've helped a little bit along, around the Braille Trail, which has been really appreciated. Um, a while back, they asked us if they could if they could put down some cut material on the slope of that hill to try to help stabilize it, and I believe we thought that was okay. I I would I would concur that it's gotten a little bit beyond what we anticipated and we probably need to revisit that and make sure that what we thought was going to be sort of a, a makeshift core log erosion control is not becoming um, more of a brush dump and i think um we'll we'll take a look at that and we'll we'll work with perkins and they've been a great partner so i I think we'll be able to resolve whatever uh, if there's too much material in there to get some of it out of there and maybe stop putting new material in there. Great. And uh, final question concerns the island across from the Watertown Yacht Club. I've seen it referred to in some maps as Sunrise Island or Sun Island. Um, are you familiar with that I island? Mm -hmm. um, is there any possibility of recreational uses like a landing there? Perhaps for kayakers. Um, well, or is it twenty one e? You know, I, unfortunately, I mean, maybe I, I should say maybe we have never thought that. It, it, I will say there aren't a lot of places left along this part of the river that are really um, wildlife respites, and that's an important place. Uh, the Black Crown Night Heron, which you see around Watertown Dam, when we have that great fish run of alewife and sh and uh, and um, Every year, the blueback heron come up the river, and it's just a great um, natural phenomena at the Watertown Dam. And the night heron are all around here fishing and eating, and it's a really important roosting area. And that island serves as a roosting area for them. So we want to be careful uh, about what we'd introduce there for human use, but um, I wouldn't say absolutely not, but I just think we want to be careful. You know, it, it's a ter terrific refuge and a great spot for kayaking to see all the activity uh, at the island. So, well, um, I'm going to leave it at that, um, but I do thank everyone involved. This is an amazing project, and I look forward to seeing the results as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gassler. So um, I'm going to go back to the chat. So David was able to post his comments in the chat, so thank you for doing that. Um, I will read them so that we can um, have them captured in the recording. Um, just wanted to say there is a lot of granite debris along the river between the North Beacon Street Bridge and the Thompson Footbridge, mostly blocks and slabs. These should be reused or removed. Two are at the landing near Palmer Street. Perhaps they could be reset as a kayak landing. Also, on top of Perkins Hill is a large spreading oak, one of the best trees in the park. You uh, you show two trees nearby. Do not crowd or screen this tree. Um, so thanks for the comments. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, we will not yeah. we will not crowd that tree. I agree. It's a it's a stellar statement tree. Yep. And then Nancy also said that uh, it's really great that this project's moving forward. And thanks to everyone involved. So thank you, Nancy. And um, from here we'll move over to Susan. So Susan, I'll give you permissions to unmute your mic, so you should be able to do that now. Um, so Susan, yeah, there's a microphone button um, towards the, the top of Teams um, that should allow you to toggle it now to, to be able to speak. Um, um, also in the chat, um, that island that John Gannon mentions near the Yacht Club should be left wild. I totally agree with you, Dan. I would like to see some of the debris that has been left by the Yacht Club should be removed. Um, so I guess we can move over to Kim as Susan tries to figure out the 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 mic or if there are issues with it. You can also let us know in the in the chat as well. Um, so I'm allowing you to uh, meet yourself, Kim.
Okay, so um, so both Susan and Kim should you should both have uh, permissions to unmute your mic, but um, it's not being reflected on our end. So um, I don't know if you'd like to provide your comments in the chat. Um, but if not, I believe that's all of the comments tonight. So we can wait a little bit to see if um, you can have that posted either in the chat or um, know how to, uh, to to figure out how to get the uh, mics unmuted. Sorry, one moment. Um, OK, can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, super. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm Kim Charlson and I'm chair of the Watertown Commission on Disability. And I um, I just wanted to say that I'm very impressed with the plan. Um, Dan Driscoll, I'm so happy to see you be part of this. Um, I worked with you closely on the, the Braille Trail and I know there were a lot of other people, but you were terrific. So thank you. And I wanted to just get a little more clarification um, I'm delighted that this is kind of the last component of ADA compliance for the Charles River. Um, but can you elaborate a little bit on, you said there was one portion of the trail that because of the narrowness will, um, will not be um, ADA compliant. And I wanted to understand that a little better and ask if you've consulted with any wheelchair users or I mean, you've got your own teams for sure, but sometimes users can figure out some alternatives that maybe your architects and designers might not have thought of. So, yeah, the um, <clears throat> the section that I'm talking about is really right at the base of the Perkins Hill, between the the um, the toe of the hill and the toe of the slope, up coming up the riverbank. That path is probably three feet from the river in some sections. So there's really no room to expand it or widen it without doing some pretty aggressive clearing of trees. And you'd probably have to cut into the slope and build a crib wall. So the path will be wide enough. The width will be compliant for a wheelchair, but we can't get below 5% slopes on all sections of it. So, you know, somebody, uh, you know, if you happen to be a guy that can do the, or a woman that does the marathon or is, you know, a, a, an able-bodied athletic disabled person of which there are many, or happen to have a motor, you'll be able to get down through there. But as far as full compliance for what I think you're talking about, Kim, um, that's, that's almost impossible to get on that backside. But there will be an ADA compliant route to come along the sidewalk and eventually transition down along the river and enjoy all the other same amenities that everyone else does. So we're doing our best everywhere we can. We're going to we're going to get compliance and you'll be able to come into the park before the Perkins Hill to the east between the Yacht Club and the park. You'll be able to come in there now in a way that you currently cannot. One of the crosswalks is going to go straight across from Bay Street right into that park and we're going to build up the um, the transition into the park so that will be ADA compliant in a way that it currently is not and people will be able to come down in there and utilize the benches and 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 the views of the river and the new overlook so there will be some improvements in that area just not that one narrow section behind the hill I, I really appreciate your explanation because um, that one portion of the hill is it, it's steep, but you did assure me that for, you know, for a more athletic um, wheelchair user who might be wanting to, to, to use it, they can. So Correct. it's just going to be um, a steeper slope than than other other areas, but there's also alternatives and that's really important. So thank you for that explanation. I really appreciate it. And You're thank welcome. you for your work on the project. It's great. It's our pleasure. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Kim. So uh, Susan, I see you have your mic unmuted. So I'll, I, I... You're, are you talking to me, Susan Ledoux? Yep, we can hear okay, you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I would like to echo other people who have said this is a great project and um, I'm really pleased that it's moving forward. Um, I, I had one thought about the trees. 
Dan, you had said, we're, you know, you're going to be putting in many more than you have to take. But my concern is that sometimes trees take a long time to grow and sometimes we put small ones in where there were big ones. Is there really no, no way that you can take fewer trees than you than are planned to take now? I mean, what's um, the criteria for that decision? So, Susan, th thank you for the comment. Look, we 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 at DCR we we cherish all the trees on, on, on our tree parks. Tree. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're trying hard. Um, we walked the site. You you if you go out and look where we cut trees down, some came down yesterday, some today. Um, I think easily ninety percent of what we cut, we're considering to be hazard trees. In other words, they're overhanging the path. And they had cavities in them where we actually considered them a public safety hazard. And we have to be particularly careful in this area because, as was noted earlier, there are people out in this parkland, unlike some of our other parks, there's a larger population of people with visual disabilities. So if it was a, a branch is coming down or something, we wanted to be, we err on the side of being conservative. If a tree looks like it's a hazard and could harm people if they were on the path and, and branches or the tree itself came down. What we did do when we cut them, you'll notice the trees that came down, we left as much of the main trunk as possible, knowing that that could serve as habitat for creatures and critters uh, out here. So we're doing our best to do that. Um, but I again, very few, I think two healthy trees had to be cut in total in this project. One was near the monument and one was near where we have to create the ADA access to the playground. We had to take one down there that probably had a four or five inch diameter. And we will replant trees in those vicinities as part of this. Um, but I appreciate your comment and concern. Yeah, I, I think that's wonderful. I didn't realize those were hazard trees. I was just concerned about whether the there would be wildlife habitat and also whether the canopy would be reduced um but i know you can't help having to take some health a couple of healthy trees yeah yeah, yeah. appreciate thank that thank you uh thanks susan um so from here i think we'll move over um to michael but i just wanted to let everyone know that I posted the link where you will be able to find the recording and the presentation after the meeting, and um, we will have that circulated out um, shortly after as well. And um, Stefan Scalinci from our Office of Government Affairs is on the call, who will also help us circulate that out. Um, so, and thank you, Stefan, for helping organize this meeting. It's I know there was a lot of uh, outreach and um, assistance that you've helped provided to help get this meeting on the books. So. Uh, thanks, Stefan. And from here, we'll move over to, to Michael. So, um, Michael, I'll give you permission um, to unmute your mic. Um, so, Michael, are you? Yep. There we go. Um, uh, thanks, guys. Hey, um, I wanted to ask if there were was a more detailed project schedule available anywhere. Uh, I appreciate what you showed us. Um, it shows a project moving through fall of next year um i'd like to i'd like to know if there's something more detailed so we can kind of see uh, earlier or sooner rather than later uh if this thing is going to slide into 2023 the phase one um of this project went on quite a bit longer than scheduled and i'm, I'm just concerned that this is going to do the same thing yeah i appreciate that um you know we, we certainly can provide um through the town elected officials or a town website and our own website, you know, quarterly updates on the construction um, progress, uh, maybe every few months. And we'll certainly give it to the, to the state rep and Senator Brownsberger's office so they can help communicate that for us. Um, I'm, I'm really confident this will not go beyond fall of 2022. Um, honestly, this could be done a little earlier than that. We're saying fall to be generous and give ourselves, make sure we have enough time to, to wrap up the planting. Sometimes it's the planting that pushes the, the season because you do the planting at the end and if it starts getting too cold, you get pushed to the next spring. 
in this case, we're going to get a lot of planting in in the spring and then we'll wrap it up in the fall. So um, I, I, I would say with confidence, you know, there's always unforeseen circumstances in construction, um, but we are pretty confident that fall of 2022, everyone's going to be out there enjoying and utilizing this and hopefully we'll all see you all out there at a ribbon cutting. That would be great. I, I would say too, I really we do appreciate this happening. This this uh, area has been uh, uh, critical to everybody's uh, mental well-being during this last year and a half of, of lockdown. It's been a real resource for everybody in the area to get out and 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 see each other in a nice, safe environment and I, and get some uh, get some nature time. Excellent, Jeff. We did you want to comment on the schedule, Jeff? I, I, are you good? Uh, just anyone who's concerned about the project schedule and the schedule slipping toward the end, my advice to you is to make friends with the resident engineer. Dan talked about that in his comments earlier. There is no one that knows the schedule better than the resident engineer. We, like Dan said, we'll do our best to update people with a uh, paper form of the schedule if and when there are changes. But day to day, the resident knows exactly what's happening. If there are delays with weather or getting supplies or whatever may be happening, the resident will know. Um, and like Dan said, that's that's the the representative for the construction phase of the project to you, the neighborhood. Uh, so I encourage you to introduce yourself to him and just check in. That's why he's there. Ask him how it's going every couple of weeks, uh, and he'll be happy to to give you the information that he has on that. Well, that's I excellent. will uh, I will introduce myself to him. All right, excellent. Thank you, Jeff. And I just will add, you know, there you guys know we're we're in a we're in a pandemic, right? So still, and because of that, we have supply shortages. But we've been the the team, the contractor have really been great. They understand there's about a five to six month lag time right now to order granite curbing. We're already getting ready to place our orders. So we're really on top of the items that could cause delays. Um and and credit to our team and and the field engineer that's out there so thanks for those comments jeff thanks michael for the question and um from here uh we no longer have any hands raised so if anyone else would like to raise their hands we can have you speak during the meeting but uh in light of that there are a lot of questions posted in the chat so thanks everyone for um being in the chat and i'll just start reading some of those now um so uh Ernesta said, thank you all for the great work. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Councillor Gannon says here again, I agree with Marcia about the unsightly yacht club debris on the island. The yacht club has for decades been dumping boat storage materials on the island. Can a separate effort be made to force the yacht club to remove such materials in an environmentally safe manner? Um, well, you know, honestly, the, the local conservation commission would have jurisdiction over that if if illegal dumping is happening on the island and people are pretty confident they know who the perpetrator is, it would be within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission to issue a cease and desist order, which could include a removal and cleanup um, along with that. Um, that carries some politics with it that need to be thought through, but it's um, it's certainly an action that I, I, I haven't noticed how flagrant it is or if it would warrant an activity like that and dcr as well also has jurisdiction over any um illegal dumping or materials and so we also could follow up with the concom and support such an action uh to make sure that it gets remediated yep and um thanks for the comment and uh yeah, we'll, we'll uh, move to the next one then. So Leslie here says, I would like to also suggest that the lower path below Perkins to the Yacht Club be pedestrian only. There are already two bike paths available to cyclists. It would be nice to have one pedestrian path only or signage to give pedestrians right of way on the lower trail. That lower trail is very tempting to mountain bikers and they often come bombing along there. And I think that that sentiment's been echoed uh, a couple of times, but Dan, I don't know if you want to. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly open to it. We, what we've done in the past is, on situations like this is we may consider signage that would say, you know, um, please walk bicycles through this section, especially when it gets down to the four foot section where it just is not really safe for 
pedestrians to, to navigate a bike coming toward them. So, um, yeah, I think we should give serious consideration to making that a, a, a walk your bike sort of segment. Um, I think where it widens back out to the eight foot stabilizer path that through the park and back up toward the yacht club, that that can sustain a shared use condition. But the narrow section, um, yeah, J Jeff and I will talk more about that and think about it. One thing that's even more effective than signs, and a lot of us believe that signs are ugly. I know we disagree on that. We have sign clutter complaints elsewhere in the system, uh, and you've seen the ones that are there that are there today. They're not in good condition and they're unsightly. Uh, but one thing that's even more effective than signs is the presence of people. So we will make these improvements here through this project, which we believe will attract more people to use the pathway on foot, and the cyclists will learn over time that they will expect more people if they choose that route and they'll be less likely to, to choose it because there are too many people there. So the faster cyclist, because we're also building out the roadway as well, will either choose the on-street bike lane or even the sidewalk that we're building, which is also an option to them. So cyclists will have three options. They We can post signs, but in the end, they will choose the route that they are or they like the most or are more comfortable with. And we'll do the best we can to, to keep the faster cyclists off the walking path. Um, but um, when when more people are using it, we think that the in, in our experience, the bicyclists will choose another way naturally. Yeah, great point. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Stan. So actually, we're going to move over to Peter now. So Peter has his hand raised here. Um, so I'm going to give you permissions to unmute your mic, so you should be able to do so now. OK, uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Well, I just, you know, it's wonderful to see this project um, <clears throat> finally coming to fruition. And I want to, you know, of course, thank uh, everybody at the DCR and our elected officials. And I also want to mention someone whose name hasn't come up, but has really played a big role in this. And that's Herb Nolan of the Solomon Fund, uh, going back, you know, a dozen years, uh, pushing everybody to make it happen. And of course, Dan has been there from the beginning, uh, helping to sort of implement this whole um, vision for how we could sort of upgrade this section of the Charles River, and it's finally happening. And I have two questions that I want to ask. And the first one is pretty predictable that I would be asking this question, but uh, it has to do with the ongoing maintenance that is going to be required, particularly to make sure that the plantings survive. Uh, you know, I gather it's, you know, uh, based on what I've seen in other sections of the, the you know, the river that have been uh, under control of DCR, this on this after the follow up afterwards has been somewhat lacking and the plant things, uh, you know, if they haven't died outright, they've deteriorated and been overgrown by weed. So that's really that's my first question is what what uh, what are the plans for ongoing maintenance of this site once the construction is completed? Um, <clears throat> good, good question, Peter. And yeah, we 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 share that concern. Look, we're we're short staffed. Um, our operations guys, we we have you know for the entire Charles River system, um, we're lucky if we get a half dozen people out here in you know full time in the in the season, and it's a lot of land. Um, so. We certainly are looking for any help that others can offer in helping us with some of that. Um, and the, we did do one thing that I think is going to be proactive in helping the viability of the plant material, which is we're increasing our warranty period to 24 months. A lot of times what happens is we do a 12 month warranty and by the time it gets planted and you finally cycle back and you realize that there's deterioration or you know that the plant material was not what you had hoped it's the your warranty is done so this way you get a full planting cycle and the following spring to do your inspections and we will do our best to stay on top of that so that you know anything that fails will be will be um, done under warranty i know peter you're probably talking a little bit about what happened on green old boulevard we lost a number of trees out there and that was due to a combination of the warranty but it's also with climate change, we get some severe droughts now. We did really well this summer where if anything, we had more rain than we needed. Yeah. But the, um, you know, the, the year we did Greeno, there was one of the more severe droughts in 20 years. And yeah. you just, 
you just can't water enough. The other thing that we're doing uh, to try to strengthen our plant material success is watering used to be sort of an optional thing for the contractor and they would sort of water at their own uh, pleasure. We now have made watering a pay item. So when they go out and water, they get paid. That's a big difference than That's saying great. you're responsible for it. Because a lot of them just say, well, I'll take my chances. And if it dies, I'll have to go replace it. And we want to eliminate that. So watering is an irrigation of the new material is now a pay item. And we have a 24 month warranty and we'll try to keep on top of it. But with people like you, Peter, helping keep an eye on it for us is, is certainly helpful. Well, that's great. I, the the two-year warranty is really, uh, I, I'm all in favor of that. Now, my second question relates to the fact that, you know, I've lived on Riverside Street for over 30 years, and I've spent a lot of time, you know, walking the, the various paths along the river and watching how things have changed. And that lower path uh, behind, you know, the Perkins Hill that everybody's been talking about is the one part of the project that really uh, concerns me. And I know that, you know, the current plan, you know, calls for flexible porous paving to go down. But in my experience, when you put in any kind of, uh, you know, pavement, paving path, that requires a foundation, which requires digging, which requires excavation. And my, one of the things that, you know, I've often felt about that as I've walked that path is that some sort of, rather than thinking about putting in a paved path, regardless of what the composition is, but any paved structure, but instead essentially creating almost an elevated boardwalk. So in other words, you're not trying to, you can stabilize the banking using large rocks, but then not putting a path in, but essentially treating that area like, you know, it's a stream and you've got to build a little bridge over it and that will uh, minimize the amount of disturbance to the actual edge. And I think that it will essentially, because I, I just see erosion problems are just going to continue as the river level rises and with the path so close to the river, it's, you know, it's just bound to sort of uh you know start ebbing away and so has any thought been given to actually creating an elevated what i would say a boardwalk for portions of that path where you're very close to the river um we we briefly looked at that peter it, it's a it would be a really complicated construction to get the footings into the ground you, you still would end up with extensive tree removal there's so much root bound material there that to actually get the footings in that would give us the torque that we need to build a structure on top of it by the time you did that you may end up doing more damage than than you might think and th this material that we're going to use you actually don't have to excavate much out you can build up on top of the roots that's why we like it um but yeah do i think you know and the, and the river itself the elevation is held steady by the Amelia Earhart Dam. I'm sorry, by the Charles River Dam. Yeah, That's my right. mystic dam. So the Charles River Dam, the water elevations on that river, despite climate change, never changed by more than a few inches. Bill Goda, who's our, our, our dam uh, supervisor, controls the water elevations of that river. So whether it's during a flood stage or a big event or a drought, they don't change much. And so that I think that it won't, it, the, you know, the boat traffic is part of the problem. And the more we can get people to comply with the no wake rule, which, you know, doesn't always happen. Right. Uh, but that there is a no wake law on that river. And that means going about five miles an hour. And that does not always happen. When you get wakes, they lap up on the banks. And this material should be much tougher than anything else we could put in there. Um, so I, I appreciate the comment and we believe me, we do a lot of boardwalks, as you know, and in the right application, they're outstanding uh, amenities to be to put in. I think here it was just too tight and the footings themselves would would cause a lot of problems to the tree well, material. Well, my, my evidence for the, you know, what I assumed was a sign of maybe rising river level is the fact that most of the trees along that edge 
are either dead or falling over or have already fallen over that the vegetation along that tight edge is in really poor shape. So, you know, whether some something is getting to those trees and it, I think that, you know, putting that path in there, there, there are very few trees on the river side of that path that are, you know, that are even there that are, you know, could be saved even if you really wanted to. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, Peter, I, I would, I'll say, listen, we, this is a location that if, if Jeff and I were coming out here today, we would probably not decide to put a path here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. It's, 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 you know, it's four feet from the river. We just right. environmentally, we don't put paths four feet from the river. This right. was put in historically. It was done with asphalt. That was probably the wrong material. And we're kind of taking a, a bad situation and making it as good as we can. Okay. I think to, to close that to the public at this point, um, I don't think would have been the right decision. So I think we're doing the best we can. And we'll, I'd love to have you come out and look at some of this stuff with us because you always have great ideas on this. So maybe we'll circle you back out in the field. To, All right, to anytime. Thanks for, the, thanks for yeah. taking my questions. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks, Dan, uh, for for addressing them. So uh, at this point, uh, again, there are no hand raised at this point. So um, and we we intended to go to 7:30, but um, if you know we go through the chat and there aren't any more comments and no more hands raised, uh, we'll we'll end the meeting early. So let me go to the chat now. Um, so the last comment I read. Um, was about the the bikes bombing down the path. So now we'll go over to to John and Sharon. Um, if it hasn't already been said before, kudos to Sarah Ryan and uh, Marsha uh, Zero for their diligent, persistent, and consistent and uh, constructive work uh, to encourage this project. Um, thanks for those comments and thanks again for um, you know ev everyone's advocacy, especially Sarah and um, Marsha's here. So thanks everyone and um, and thanks for coming tonight. Uh, Dave Martin says, I realize this is not part of this project, but is there any plan to repair the severe erosion that has occurred on the river pathway between the Watertown Yacht Club in uh, uh, Squibnocket Park? Um, there is not an active, there's an intent. We we know about it. We'd like to do some work there. We've been looking closely at Squibnocket. Squibnocket Park is a... Um, you know, it, it was a, fo a former contamination site, part of what came out of the arsenal and the arm army site. So we have to be really careful there with what you can plant. The reason Squibnocket is a big open space of grass is we we actually cannot plant trees in that park because of some of the capping and lining that went on underneath. So, um, yeah, we're aware of it. Um, we've looked at Squibnocket as maybe being a place that could be a a good place to launch kayaks as we, that's come up a couple of times tonight um because it, it does have better grades than some of the areas uh near bay street so um yeah in a future phase we want to get out and do some additional improvements uh to that section but it's not currently in our capital plan mm -hmm. uh thanks dan and um so dave actually has his hand raised here so i'm gonna just give dave uh the ability to unmute his mic. So Dave, you should be able to do so now. Yes, uh, does everybody hear me now? I yep. Think I muted. Great, yes, well, thank you for answering that. That wasn't the reason I raised the hand, but the, but, but it's good that you addressed uh, the, 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 the question. But my question is the area, the pathway right behind between the, the Squib Nocket Park and the, and the Yacht Club. There's erosion, it looks like it could have been bicycles or maybe some people doing a, a excessive pruning of a small undergrowth on the edge of the, the bank of the parkway but if you go on the parkway you could even go on a google map tour someone wrote a, a bicycle on a google <laughs> and has it on a you can see it in a google street view but uh, it's that area there of concern and i happen to like that that park open myself. I mean, seeing people play volleyball, I haven't been part of it, but uh, yeah. I, I, I have no issue with that. But my reason for, for raising this is more addressing the subject. Uh, could people please observe, let's say, the flowering uh, uh, apple trees or springtime trees and how the blossoms are in the spring? Because sometimes what you see with that 
uh, is not obvious later. And if there's pruning done, it can, it can severely affect the beauty of the area uh, during springtime when like lower, lower apple branches or are, 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 are maybe don't look nice during other times, but are, are blooming. So if people, if, if the DCR could observe during, let's say springtime during bloom and take that in consideration, that, that's all. Yeah, I'll pass that on to our operations staff. Good comments, Dave. We'll um, agree the beauty of those apple trees is, is uh, important and should be preserved and not over pruned. Thank you so much. You did a great yep. job. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Thanks, Dave. Um, so at this point in light of time, I'm, I won't take any more hands raised and I'll just finish up with the chat. So um, we just finished Dave's comment here. So uh, Marcia's here saying uh, not to beat a dead horse. Um, she wishes her neighbor on Charles River Road was here tonight. Uh, he has been walking with a cane for the past few months because of a crash with the bicyclists on the lower path. Many bicyclists don't learn and don't care about pedestrians. I myself took someone to the hospital who was hit by a bicyclist years ago. This is our experience on a daily basis. So uh, thanks uh, for that comment. I know that um, we've we've uh, been talking about um, the bikes on the on the lower path tonight. Um, the, and and um, I just want to make sure that we read your comments to have it captured on the recording. Um, I don't know um, if we want to say uh, more to a Dan or Jeff, but um, I just want to make sure that we we captured uh, her, her comment here. Um, um, no, I, no, I, th I think we, we've heard it loud and clear. We we've, we've been talking about it, you know, back to yeah. the initial community meetings, and I I think they're good comments. I think it's right, and we'll have to give serious consideration to making this a. Um, as I said, I think you know bicycles must be walked on each end of the narrow path is probably. A, a sign solution, but I also think Jeff's point is an excellent one that, you know, increased use with this path being new and fixed and, you know, the bikes don't like to have to stop and, and be hassled by too many people in their way. So that hopefully will help. Um, and I think it will. I think Jeff's right. So a combination of that and and if you put a sign up that bikes must be walked in this section, you know, you, you don't want to get encourage um conflict between users but certainly it, it you know it's sort of people can kind of authorize themselves to say hey you're not supposed to be biking through here and then if it's a rule it, you know you have a little more people get feel a little more sheepish when they're caught so we'll we'll work with you on that thanks and um so councillor gannon's here saying a uh, question to the dcr and our legislative delegation has there been any thought by dcr or others to create a uh, friends of group to continue advocacy for Watertown's riverfront parks. Um, yeah, we're all, it's open to that. You can you can follow up, Dan. But yeah, we we um, I mentioned in Peter's comments, we're always looking for help. You know, any any friends group that wants to help with stewardship and maintenance and trash cleanup in the spring, especially um, helping to keep the Braille trail and all those great you know elements of the braille trail like the boats that need to be restained uh, every year or so so yeah there's a lot of things out here we need some help with and um an organized friends group would be i think very welcome yep uh, and i would uh you know echo those those sentiments stan i think that um you know we're, we're very open to it and working with um you all uh can in, in a more um continued basis outside of this meeting as well so um Susan says, thanks to everyone for the persistence uh, and hard work you put in to keep this project moving. It's a wonderful undertaking and I appreciate that it's not easy. Kudos and uh, kudos to you, Susan. Thank you. Um, Jim and Kate, uh, speaking of the Watertown Dam, I have been hearing rumors that there is a plan to remove the dam and fish ladder. Does this team have any insight into these rumors? I don't, I don't know. I do. Um, okay. we, 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 <laughs> nice. We've been having a lot of conversations yep. about this over the years. Um, we we we're in discussions. We we have concerns about it. Um, I'll I'll be straight. You know, Bill Goda, as I mentioned, who's our he's our dam operator and knows a lot about this. Um, our our primary concern in removing the dam is that if it narrows the up the upper river. 
We've done a lot of work restoring those riverbanks and putting in overlook decks and public observation areas. And we would not like to have a unintended consequence of the overlook decks sitting in mud instead of being out in the river where people can fish and observe wildlife and all the great stuff. So we need to think long and hard about it. Um, you know, the, one of the challenges is that the fish ladder up at Moody Street actually is not functioning. So you're not gaining a whole lot of extra habitat uh, above that dam. And the Watertown Dam fish ladder is actually quite successful at helping the fish get up above there. Um, but we're, we're, certainly if there's major ecological benefits that can be proven and um, other, you know, we don't have it in our capital plan to take that dam out. But we want to we want to really do a, a quality and careful analysis of the science and the ecology and the benefits and impacts of that proposal. Thanks for the insight, Dan. And uh, that's a great question, Jim and Kate. I learned something myself tonight uh, with regard to that. So <laughs> um, I appreciate that. And um, so David says uh, there used to be friends of the Watertown Riverfront Group headed by Michael uh, Shade. So um, thanks for letting us uh, know that. I don't know if um, there's uh, any sort of, um, you know, legacy group that maybe you guys could kind of um, coordinate with or something along those lines uh, with regard to the friends of uh, comment from earlier. And uh, Jim and Kate are showing their appreciation for the answer that you just gave, Dan. So um, thanks again for that. And uh, with that, we've caught up with all the chats and all the hands raised. Um, all right. Uh, Marcia has a, a, a another very uh, long comment here regarding this, so let me just read it all again. Uh, there are a lot of there are a lot more people on that lower path now. I have rarely ever seen anyone get off their bike for pedestrians. Bicyclists always expect pedestrians to jump out of their way. The two people I mentioned who were hit were hit after a bicyclist yelled "bike on left, right," and they were and they turned the wrong way. I have myself had a foot problem this summer and have not been too agile, so I've been very afraid of bikes coming through. Just more fodder for you to think about. I do not believe that bikers will care how many people are on the path. As an example, you can see how they ride in downtown Boston where there are loads of people. Sorry, we love this plan. You are doing a great job, but I do disagree with you, Jeff, on this one. And um, we, we do hear you loud and clear, though, so we do appreciate um, you know, you kind of hitting this home so that we can, you know, think about it further so that Dan and Jeff can can talk about it. Um, your comments haven't haven't been missed tonight and um, they are being recorded for this recording as well. So um, thanks again for providing them too, because this is useful insight for us for making informed decisions in the future too. So um, with that, um, I think we're going to conclude the meeting tonight. Um, this has been very helpful for for us and we, we hope the same for you all. It's been great to hearing fr from everyone and um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Um, and Dan, Jeff, Stefan, thank you all for, um, you know, organizing and, um, you know, putting in all this work for this plan. So just want to thank everyone again and uh, wish everyone a great night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks.